Welcome back to We Are Reading Virtual Story Times Women's History Wednesdays for March 24th, 2021. Bold and Brave, 10 Heroes Who Won Women the Right to Vote, written by Kirsten Gillibrand, art by Mayra Kalman. When I was a little girl, after church on Sundays, I would visit my great-grandmother Mimi. She told me about a time when women like her left their homes and worked in factories, making equipment to help American soldiers win the war. Mimi taught me to be bold and to believe there was nothing I couldn't do. Mimi's oldest daughter was my grandmother, Polly. She liked to roller skate down the long marble hallways of the New York State Capitol where she worked. When I was about 10, Grandma took me to a big room where ladies stuffed envelopes with letters urging people to vote. I thought, I want to be just like them someday. Grandma taught me to fight for what I believe in. Grandma's oldest daughter was my mom, Penny. She always did what she set her mind to. She was a sports writer for her student newspaper, even though girls were not allowed in the press boxes. She went on to law school and was one of only three women in her class. As a mom, she also earned her black belt in karate, something few women at the time aspired to. My mother taught me you need to be brave to forge a new path. Who taught my mom and her mom and her mom to be bold and brave so they could teach you and me? I'll tell you who. The women who came before them. Women who faced unimaginable challenges. When my grandmother was born, women didn't have the right to vote. That meant they didn't have the power to elect the people who establish our country's rules and laws. Less than a century later, I became a United States Senator, which means I helped make those laws. Here are 10 women who paved the way. They were called suffragists, not because they suffered, although they most certainly did, but because suffrage means the right to vote. They fought so women could be heard. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, 1815 to 1902, Dare to be Different. In 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a young mother when she and her friends decided to hold a big meeting about women's rights. They believed something uncommon at the time, that all men and women are created equal, and wanted laws to guarantee it. They especially wanted the right to vote. The 300 women and men who attended this convention near Elizabeth's home in Seneca Falls, New York, became some of the earliest American suffragists. People made fun of the suffragists, but Elizabeth didn't let that stop her. She was fearless. As a young girl, she rode horses, learned Greek, played chess, all of which were typically just for boys. She once said, the best protection any woman could have is courage. This first convention, in July of 1848, was only the beginning of her 50-year effort to win voting rights for women, but she was not alone in her journey. Susan P. Anthony, 1820-1906, Never Give Up Susan B. Anthony was an abolitionist, which means she opposed slavery. Elizabeth Cady Stanton convinced Susan to fight for women's voting rights, too. Together they were a team. Some people said that Elizabeth forged the thunderbolts and Susan fired them. Susan traveled to the country by train and horse-drawn coach to rally support for voting rights for women, often wearing her favorite red silk shawl. She rode home, we speak in schoolhouses, barns, sawmills, log cabins with boards for seats and lanterns hung around for light, but people come 20 miles to hear us. Today, 20 miles might not seem far, but before cars, that could take all day or longer to travel that distance. In 1872, Susan tried to vote for president and was arrested. She spoke out for years and years until she died, almost 15 years before women won that right. Others carried the torch, and the amendment that finally granted women the right to vote, the 19th Amendment, is also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Sojourner Truth circa 1797 to 1883. Speak the truth. Sojourner's truth given name was Isabella Bonefree. She was born into slavery in Ulster County, New York. She left her owner in 1826, the year before enslaved people were freed in her state. Years later, she changed her name to Sojourner. 
Sojourner means someone who travels from place to place, and truth was at the center of her faith. She once said, I will shake every place I go to, and she did exactly that. Sojourner was one of the first African-American women to successfully stand up for herself in court. Her young son was still enslaved, and she sued to free him and won. Sojourner fought to end slavery and traveled the country pressing equality for all. She worked with some of the most important thinkers of the day, such as abolitionist Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln. In 1851, she spoke at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio, and in 1867, the American Equal Rights Association meeting in New York. Sojourner asserted that all people deserve the right to vote, no matter the color of their skin or if they were male or female. Sojourner lived to bring justice to others, proclaiming that truth is powerful and will prevail. Harriet Tubman, circa 1822 to 1913. Be strong and courageous. Harriet Tubman was born into slavery in Dorchester County, Maryland, and had a very hard life. But her faith in her family taught her that she was special, strong, and brave. In 1849, Harriet escaped from slavery, then spent years helping her family and others escape. She wrote a letter to a friend explaining why. I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. She was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, a network of those who helped bring enslaved people to freedom. She ran toward danger, not away from it. Harriet was so courageous and so certain about what to do that people often called her General Tubman. During the Civil War, Harriet served as a nurse, an armed scout, and a spy. After the war, she turned her efforts to gaining suffrage for all women and especially interested in the rights of African American women. In 1898, Harriet gave speeches for women's rights in New York City, Boston, and Washington, D.C. She continued to help people throughout her life. Today, designers at the U.S. Mint which make our money, are considering a new $20 bill bearing her image to honor her bravery and conviction. Yovita Idar, 1885 to 1946, Fight for Fairness. Yovita Idar was born in Laredo, Texas. Her father published a Spanish language newspaper. Like him, Yovita loved to read and write and to speak out. She became a teacher, a civil rights activist, a journalist, and, just like her dad, a newspaper publisher. She focused on the violence against and mistreatment of Mexican Americans and the importance of women's rights, including the right to vote. In her first teaching job, Yovita found herself without books, pencils, or paper for the children. Many had no food, and sometimes the school had no heat in the winter. Yovita vowed to change that, and she did. In 1911, she helped found and became the first president of the League of Mexican Women, which focused on education and women's rights. She later started a free kindergarten, which provided school supplies, food, and clothing for the children. Yovita believed education was vital. Educate a woman and you educate a family. Alice Paul, 1885-1977. Shake Things Up. Alice Paul grew up in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Later, she was a student in England, where she saw women fighting for their right to vote by using tactics that were shocking for the early 1900s, protesting with signs, marching with banners, and even breaking windows. Alice joined in their fight. Although she was arrested and imprisoned, Alice believed American women needed to use these same methods. Once home, Alice helped to organize the first natural National Parade for Women's Suffrage in Washington, D.C. on March 3, 1913. She chose the day before the inauguration of the new president, Woodrow Wilson, to pressure him and Congress to vote for national women's suffrage. During the parade, 5,000 women marched in elegant white clothes, rode horses, and drove floats and cars. They held many banners, signs, and flags demanding the right to vote. Votes for women and forward into the light. Many onlookers pushed and shouted at them, but the world paid attention. It was a new kind of fight, and a fight they would soon win. Inez Milholland, 1886 to 1916. Your voice matters. 
One young woman who stood out on the day of the 1913 parade was Inez Milholland, a lawyer and women's rights activist who led the procession on horseback. When she heard some organizers didn't want African-American women to march, she insisted that black students from Howard University be included in the education section. Inez wore, rode a white horse named Grey Dawn. She wore a crown with a star, which she called the Star of Hope, and even carried a trumpet to herald a new day. The image of her riding at the front of the army of women inspired many people. Sadly, Inez died a few years later, still battling for women's rights to vote. Her final public words were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? This question became the rallying cry for the movement. Inez proved that her voice truly mattered in life and in death. Ida B. Wells, 1862-1931, Tell Your Story. Orphaned at 16 in Holly Springs, Mississippi, Ida B. Wells fought for her place in the world her whole life. When she was only 22 years old, a train conductor told Ida to give up her seat because she was sitting in the ladies' coach, which he said was only for white women. Ida had a first-class ticket, so she refused to move. Three men dragged her out. As soon as she got home to Memphis, she sued the railroad. Even though she didn't ultimately win her court fight, her bravery inspired later activists. Ida became a respected journalist who wrote about her experiences and the violence and injustice faced by African Americans throughout the country. She believed that the people must know before they can act, and there is no educator to compare with the press. Ida founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago in 1913 to organize African American women to fight for voting rights. During the 1913 parade in Washington, D.C., she ignored racist objections and marched with the otherwise white Illinois delegation on behalf of the Alpha Suffrage Club. To encourage others, she wrote, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth, uh, truth upon them. Lucy Burns, 1879 to 1966, Persistence is Powerful. Like her good friend Alice Paul, Lucy Burns learned from the suffrage campaign in London that fighting for change requires boldness and persistence. After the 1913 parade success, she and Alice decided on a new tactic to bring attention to their cause. Four years later, they began a silent vigil outside the White House. Protesters carried banners in purple, gold, and white, as well as signs with messages. Some bore Inez Milholland's final words. These women were known as the Silent Sentinels. They stood outside the White House holding signs for five months before the police began arresting them. Even then, they did not stop. In an article in the paper she and Alice published, Lucy urged the Sentinels to stay strong and called them an unconquerable army. Sometimes the women were jailed for months, including Lucy, who was arrested several times and spent the most time in jail, all because they dared to protest. Mary Church Terrell, 1863 to 1954, Stand Together. Mary Church Terrell was a teacher and served on Washington, D.C.'s Board of Education, the first African-American woman to hold such a position. Her fight for suffrage inspired many because, like Sojourner Truth, she challenged the unique discrimination against black women and insisted they be included in the national women's suffrage movement. In 1896, Mary helped found and lead the National Association of Colored Women. She spoke around the country and around the world praising the valiant service of black women who knock at the bar of justice and ask for an equal chance. Mary knew it wasn't fair that some white women wanted to exclude women of color from the suffrage movement. She advised the Howard University students of Delta Sigma Theta, a sorority of black women dedicated to public service, and organized them to march in the 1913 parade. Despite a segregated society and having to fight to be included, the Howard University sorority sisters proudly marched together in the education section. In their final push for national women's suffrage, Mary and her daughter Phyllis protested outside the White House as silent sentinels. Mary continued to fight against discrimination, knowing that not until all women reached their full potential could America reach hers.
Finally, in 1919, Congress passed the 19th Amendment, and it was ratified in 1920. It guaranteed women the right to vote more than 70 years after Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped organize the Seneca Falls Convention. It would be another 45 years before the right was protected for African-American women and men in many Southern states. Today, women have far more rights, but the fight for equality and justice continues. On January 21st, 2017, millions of people across the country marched once more so that women's voices could be heard. I remember the stories of the courageous women whose lives and sacrifices shaped the country and thought of the march that Alice Paul dreamed up more than 100 years ago. I stood in front of the crowd of women gathered in Washington, D.C., wearing bright pink hats and called out, We want to be counted. We want to be heard. We are going to fight for what we believe in, and we are not turning back. Now it's your turn. You are the suffragists of our time. What would you change if you could? Stand up, speak out, and fight for what you believe in. Be bold and brave. The future is yours to make. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. 19th Amendment to the Constitution, August 18th, 1920. The End